So, Chrisanne, go ahead. Chrisanne, you got to unmute. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. That's the um, best way to introduce me, Chris Ann. I know. I know. I'm just stellar. Anyway, I want. I, what I want to say is, it really, it is my honor to introduce the club to um, Tim Murphy. And I actually remember when Tim joined the Rotary Club of Edina in 1995 because he came in. He has such a presence and an enthusiasm. He's so gregarious. And I remember fellow Rotarians saying. Isn't Tim a great guy? You take your car to his place, don't you? And you know, I didn't know anything about his business, but he um, has several locations with car care. And and at some point in our presentation, Tim, be sure to tell everyone the the businesses that you own because I can vouch for you. My mother will only take her car to you. So <laughs> that's like that's as good as it gets. My <laughs> So anyway, Tim was immediately recognized as the kind of leader perfect for Rotary. And so he did become the president of our Rotary Club. He became district governor for 5950. He has led district-wide programs like the Foundation and International Chair, the Pets Conference. And now he is a zone coordinator for N Polio Now. And zone, a zone is just a large region. You know, we're in a district, we're district 5960 but a zone includes several districts. So Tim, you'll probably tell us how many clubs are, are in your zone. Anyway, the world eradicated the smallpox virus in the 50s and Rotary made it their mission to eradicate polio. And we took that leadership in the 80s and we are so close to the finish line. So Tim is here to give us a brief history of why we chose this virus to eradicate and where we're at with our efforts. With our efforts. So Tim, thanks so much for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chris Ann, for a great introduction. And uh, I, I am passionate about Rotary, it's almost to a fault. Uh, my wife reminds me constantly. Um, they have put me out to pasture within my company uh, uh, about five years ago now. So literally I am a full-time Rotarian and I have been very heavily involved in a lot of global initiatives as Chris Ann mentioned. I too have been a, a, a GSE team leader uh, to, to East Africa. And uh, I haven't been as involved in youth exchange as Chris Ann has, but uh, when you're a district governor, you get a two year tenure on the board. So I got a, a good taste of it. I have a son who's uh, now a Rotarian and will be his club president next year that I'm very proud of. And what got him involved in Rotary was youth exchange. So um, I happen to not have joined Rotary for this reason, but, and I can't remember which one of you shared with me, uh, had polio, who was that? Greg? I believe it was Greg. Uh, my father is a polio survivor. My father had polio when he was 10 and 11 years old in 1942 and 43. He was one of the first individuals to be treated for polio at Sister Kinney Institute. Uh, it, uh, some of you may have heard Sister Kinney was considered a quack from Australia that, you know, found a home at the University of Minnesota and ended up forming Sister Kinney Institute, which now in the Twin Cities is Courage Kinney, uh, because polio obviously has been almost non-existent in the Twin Cities for years. Uh, Dad was, uh, it stunted his growth in his right arm and his right leg. Uh, but he lived to be 86. And I, uh, my personal opinion is his fight for polio when he was 10 and 11 years old strengthened him. Uh, my justification for that is he had six siblings. So there were seven of them. And dad outlived the closest sibling by uh, 16 years. He lived to be 86 years old. We lost him a year ago, December. Uh, so my new job in Rotary, as our, as Chrisanne mentioned, Zone and Polio Now coordinator uh, is right up my alley. I did have a, a good background in polio, obviously having a father that had it, and uh, I, I fit right in. Uh, as Chrisanne mentioned, 
our zone is zone 29. We are 16 districts. A district is somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 Rotarians. So generally speaking, I have the upper Midwest and each of your districts has a chair that uh, works underneath me. Uh, as many of you know, Rotary International's convention is usually held earlier this month. That was going to be early in June. It was not held, but it was held virtually. Um, uh, that was has been transpiring in the last week or two. And just last week, I happened to watch uh, the virtual and polio now booth in the House of Friendship. And John Germ, who is a past Rotary International president from 19, I think it was uh, 1617. Um, is now a trustee and is responsible for polio. Did a phenomenal 10 minute history and outline of Rotary and polio. And uh, he's much more pleasant to listen to than me. So I've conned John into letting me use that video to kind of set the stage. And then I'll come back with a lot more specifics and uh, answer questions for you. So John, if and when you're ready, you can roll it. Very good, I'll get this started, but I did want to say hi to Karen and Vicki for joining today. Nice to see your faces. Many years ago, we Rotarians made a promise to the children of the world to rid our planet of the scourge of polio. We keep our promises. And the eradication of polio remains Rotary's highest priority. In order to cross the finish line, we need to remain vigilant. As Rotarians, we need to continue to educate ourselves, our fellow members, and the public on the devastating effects of this virus on children and their families. It's my pleasure to share a special preview of Rotary's documentary, Drop to Zero. It's an in-depth look at the historic effort to eradicate polio. I know you'll find this film as meaningful as I do. Let's take a look. I had a sore throat and a high fever. My dad took me to the doctor and they called my name and I got up and collapsed. And the doctor said she has polio. Polio has preyed on humanity for thousands of years, moving around the world from person to person in an unbroken chain of infection. In the early 1950s, there was a particularly intense outbreak in the United States that crippled nearly 60,000 people. It was really frightening because there was no vaccine and you never knew who was going to get polio. Everybody knew somebody who had the disease. It's been described as the AIDS of the time. And in the past, precautions are taken to prevent gatherings of youngsters. Parents wouldn't let their children go swimming. Movie theaters were closed. You know, people were kept inside. Nobody knew what was happening. What we know today is that polio is spread by contact with contaminated food, water, or human waste. When the virus multiplies in the intestines, many children will only suffer from mild flu-like symptoms. But in one in 200 cases, it travels to the spine, attacking nerve cells that control the muscles in the arms and legs, leaving the victim paralyzed. In the worst cases, the victim dies, unable to breathe or swallow. In 1954, at the height of the epidemic, Dr. Jonas Salk tested an injectable vaccine, which offered a first ray of hope. Approximately five years later, Dr. Albert Sabin developed an oral vaccine that was less expensive and easier to use. Humanity finally seemed to be gaining the upper hand. Dr. Salk, you have said that eliminating polio is no longer a scientific problem. I 
take it you were correctly quoted. Yes, Mr. Spivak. I think that it's a social and economic problem. The uh, problem is not one of vaccine effectiveness, uh, but one of vaccine use. Jonas Salk was right. By 1979, 61 countries had used the two vaccines to eradicate polio, including the United States and Canada. But in the rest of the world, we were still seeing 350,000 children paralyzed every year. So that was part of what contributed to the launching of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative to ensure that every single child benefits from vaccination. No child should have polio. We come to this hour grateful for the achievements of the past. The drive for global eradication came from a most unlikely source. Rotary International, a group of business and professional leaders dedicated to public service, was looking for a global project to celebrate its 75th anniversary. Smallpox had been eradicated just one year before, so we decided to take on polio. It seemed like an impossible dream. When we first approached the, the World Health Organization about working with us to eradicate polio, they felt that we were amateurs, we didn't know what we were talking about, that, that we really didn't have anything to bring to the table. So Rotary went it alone, supplying volunteers and vaccines for mass immunization programs around the world. We knew that there was a vaccine that could be uh, easily administered. It could be done by non-professional individuals by just putting two little drops into the child's mouth. From Brazil to El Salvador, from Indonesia to the Ivory Coast. These initial campaigns were remarkably successful. In 1979, we did a huge uh, vaccination program in Philippines, six million children, and we found it worked. And Rotary raised money for further campaigns. If they exceeded that goal and raised 119 million, 186 million, we're over the goal. Now, the World Health Organization took notice. We went back to them and said, we've raised 248 million. Will you work with us to accomplish this? And at that point, the World Health Organization said, yes. The fact that a volunteer organization can persuade public and private people to join us in this manner, I think, says a great deal uh, for mankind that it can be done. In 1988, the World Health Organization launched a public-private partnership called the Global Polio Eradication Initiative officially adopting Rotary's dream. Without Rotary International lobbying and pressuring and forcing agencies to talk to each other and governments to talk to agencies, we, we never would have started the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. The United Nations Children's Fund agreed to purchase and distribute vaccines. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control would serve as the program's global virus hunters. You know, if you look at, at what's made a difference in terms of the progress, um, often political commitment is, has been a factor. And Rotary has been key in terms of motivating community leadership, political leadership, to, to, get, you know, to get this job done. The World Health Organization would direct the program's strategy. And Rotary would continue to supply volunteers, raise funds, and act as the program's global advocate. There were many skeptics. The sheer magnitude of vaccinating between 250 million and 400 million children every year, it's mind-boggling. It's the largest global health initiative in history involving more people on the planet than any other initiative. When the program started in 1988, the goal was to eradicate polio by the year 2000. Although the program missed its original deadline, the number of infected countries dropped from 125 to nine. To provide vaccine to remote areas, the polio program has built a globe-spanning network called a cold chain, which keeps the vaccine from spoiling. 
cold chain begins with private sector drug companies that supply billions of doses of vaccine to UNICEF, which stockpiles, manages, and transports the vaccine to polio programs around the world. It's very, very difficult at the best of times to be able to reach people consistently every month with a viable vaccine that you've kept at the right temperature and get to every household and reach every child, let alone in areas of civil crisis. This has brought to the fore our need to ensure that we do not become complacent because this is what the virus does. It surprises you. As the global program closes in on the goal of eradicating polio, all the stakes get higher. They'll say, we made a promise to the children of the world, and we haven't delivered yet, and we won't stop until we do. We need each of you to advocate for continued support from government and elected officials, to talk to your fellow club members, family, and friends, to ask them to join you in making a financial contribution. Let's not forget that every donation to End Polio Now will be matched two to one by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And finally, please encourage your district leaders to contribute district designated funds. District designated fund contributions will be matched one for one by the World Fund. And with a two to one Gates Foundation match, contributions of district designated funds will yield a six to one match. These critical funds will save lives. That's our history, our vision, and our legacy. Rotary members had the audacity to start this campaign and we won't stop until it's done. Thank you, John, and I apologize. This wasn't intended to be a uh, solicitation for funding. So uh, it, John has to throw that in as the trustee uh, responsible for raising the funds. But as you heard Steve say, uh, this is until today, the largest global health initiative in history. And, you know, obviously polio is a virus. A vaccine was found for that has been proven effective. We're in the works, in the midst of accomplishing that, hopefully for COVID. And uh, we can all hope and pray that it does not take as long to get rid of COVID-19 as it has for us to get rid of polio. Um, you know, there's a lot of controversy with polio, uh, even within Rotary. Um, you know, we have been battling this in Rotary now for 35 years and in the world uh, since its inception and uh, we haven't licked it yet. And it's costing more in, in these last few years uh, to keep it uh, uh, minimized. And I have all kinds of statistics and numbers for you in that. But, uh, you know, uh, um, it, it, back, in, back in the 50s in the United States, 60,000 children were crippled with polio. I don't have a statistic on deaths and I have never heard of that, but you know, obviously COVID-19 is much more severe than that. So good, good news, silver lining is the resources that the Global Eradication Polio Initiative, GEPI, that was referenced, its efforts now are being focused on COVID-19. Um, as, as you heard, four organizations formed the Global Polio Eradication Initiative in 1988, which was Rotary started their initiatives in it. And it took, as mentioned, quite a few years to convince Rotary. Did you lose me? For a minute we did, but you're back. Okay, sorry about that. No problem, Tim. It must be an unstable internet, internet convention. 
uh, connection. Anyway, f the four organizations, which are worldwide organizations, and all of the speakers you heard are the heads of those organizations, are the Center for Disease Control, and they find the cases for us. They're considered the hunters. Uh, World Health Organization, uh, you know, which is controversial today, particularly today, but uh, they direct the strategy. Uh, UNICEF, United Children's uh, Fund, and then, of course, Rotary International that, uh, that solicited the partners and was instrumental in the formation of it. In 1997, one of the first causes the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation jumped on was the eradication of polio worldwide. They have been the largest financial contributor to uh, polio, and I do have some numbers uh, on that too. And just last year, probably not karma, karma, or probably karma, is the Global Alliance for Vaccines Initiative called Gavi. And they right now are instrumental in obviously coordinating the efforts worldwide to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, as mentioned, the GEPI's goal was to eradicate it by 2000. We failed. It was down to nine countries from 125. Fortunately, today we're down to two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Worldwide contributions to end polio have been $18 billion. Of that $18 billion, the Gates Foundation is the largest contributor at just under $4 billion. All the governments of the world combined have put in $6.4 billion, with the United States being the largest government giver at $3.3 billion, and the UK following at 1.6. Rotary has neared $2 billion as the third largest contributor. As mentioned, Rotary was looking for initiative at its international conference celebrating its 75th anniversary, and it came up with polio now. Our, as Rotarians was done in the Philippines in 1979, the following year, and that was a Rotary only initiative because the Global Eradication Polio Initiative wasn't started until 1988. To date, this initiative has immunized 3 billion children across the world. It's taken 20 million volunteers to do that. The vast majority of them and the largest uh, feet on the ground is obviously Rotary because of our numbers. I always like to point out there's three types of polio. Uh, what's considered type one is the most crippling. Uh, year to date, we have 72 cases, 19 in Afghanistan and 53 in Pakistan. There's a rumble about concerns because that number has gone up in recent years. In, 19, or in 2017, we had 22 cases in the world. We literally, and you probably saw it, thought we were that close. 2018, 33 cases, 2019, 176. And as I mentioned, 72 year to date. In fact, it is not escalating whatsoever. Literally at 350,000 cases a year, when we started our initiative, the increase still is 99 and nine tenths to four decimal points eliminated, going from 176 cases to, uh, from 22 cases back up to 176 isn't an increase. That increase is actually caused by what was a much more effective campaign in 2019 and 2020. Some of you may have heard Pakistan's government rolled over and Pakistan's government supported the initiative so we are finally reaching the cases in the remote areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan that we haven't been able to in the last two countries of the world. Uh, there was a type two polio. 
uh, that is 100% eradicated in the world. And there is a type three, which is vaccine deprived polio virus. And it's much less crippling and uh, non-deadly. And in 2019, there was 368 cases. Year to date, we're at 100. Hmm. Uh, numbers wise, uh, just this morning, I, I checked and everybody at the end of the rotary year is always anxious. As you all well know, the Gates Foundation matches every rotary contribution two to one. So Rotary's contribution for the last five running years has been to raise $50 million a year. And the Gates matches that with another $100 million, up to $50 million and up to $100. As of this morning, which is not the year-end figure, worldwide, Rotary is at 40, almost $47 million. There are $2 million worth of matching funds left in the World Fund. Rotary's ask is as clubs to make the contributions, not necessarily as individuals. And most of our contributions come into year end. So we will not know whether we made our 50 million until uh, a week or two from now. But if it was postmarked before uh, today uh, and they get it, it will be added. We are confident we'll make the 50 million and get the full Gates match. Um, of you that don't know what DDF is, John mentioned it, I mentioned it, Rotary and its acronyms drives people nuts. It's district designated funds. Those are the dollars that you give as Rotarians to the Rotary Foundation that come back to the districts and then the clubs to be used for projects worldwide. Rotary at the end of every year does polio because it's our number one cause. The World Fund in Evanston matches districts that give district designated funds one to one. So when we make a contribution of DDF as a district, which is your money as a club, uh, the World Fund matches at a dollar and then the Gates Foundation matches that total two to one. So the leverage factor of a dollar of DDF is six to one. Um, and we are, uh, Confident we'll make it. The Gates Foundation has offered that match now for five running years and, and Rotary has succeeded in achieving it every year and usually it's in the last week of the year. So I think I have pretty much said enough and covered it. I'd like to further elaborate on anything you'd so like me to or answer any questions you may have. Thanks so much, Tim. Great, great presentation. I'll, uh, I'll get the question started. You mentioned the type one, type two, and type three. And the type two and three were less severe, but there were still quite a number of cases. Are those also only in Afghanistan and Pakistan? Or are no. those type two and type three more distributed throughout the world? There is no type two left at all. Type two oh, is eradicated. Yes, I'm sorry. That's eradicated. Thank you. Yep. Type two is eradicated worldwide. Type three is worldwide. And type three can come back. It's controversial because it's the old phenomenon that vaccinations can cause the disease. And, you know, I'm not a professional, so I don't even like explaining that. That's not the case. Where that type of polio exists is in under immunized areas. It is a worldwide concern. And think of it this way, you know, back shortly after the polio epidemic of the 40s and 50s, Mm -hmm. Every child was immunized. Mm -hmm. right, right now, today in the United States, 35 to 40 percent of the, our children are not immunized. Mm -hmm. Somebody with polio on an airplane ride like COVID-19 in the United States can bring polio over and we start all over. And that's why not giving up is so important yeah, yeah. in the last two cases, their last two countries. But good question. Thank you, John. Thank you. If you have a question, please unmute yourself and I will call on you, Vicki, or raise your hand. Oh, you're on mute, Vicki. This is just a trivial question, perhaps, but why? I've never heard of polio. It's just an epidemic. Do you know why that is? Say it again, Vicki, you cut out. And hi, oh, by sorry. the way, I didn't recognize you. I didn't look at your name. Uh, Great to see you. You too, Tim. I'm thinking I, I'm going to need you to come and speak to our club. But, I would love it. 
but it, it's just a, sort of a trivial question, but I'm curious. Um, I've never heard of polio being called a pandemic, even though it's around the world. It's just an epidemic. So when, when the U.S. talks about the last pandemic, it was 1917. So do you know why that is, why they don't call it a pandemic? I don't know why. I, you know, I really don't. Recently with COVID, it is being coined as a pandemic. Yeah. You know, but you know why that is, you know, uh, not knowing, not being a physician, you'd have yeah. to be qualified to answer that question. But, uh, you know, I saw a list of like what was considered to be pandemics. Uh, they're advocating that it had, you know, that the, the, we haven't had a pandemic worldwide since polio. Yeah. Sorry, I can't answer that any better That's than right. that. Just a curious question, so. Yeah. yeah. I've never seen that movie before. That was powerful. Just... You know, uh, too, I should tell you, uh, you can go to rotary.org and go to the convention, and there's a virtual convention going on in the break. I think are this week and next week, but they had an opening session and a closing session and and international conventions are a powerful uh, non club experience that many of you may have experienced and Hawaii this year would have been my 13th and uh, So I was hungry for seeing the general sessions and some of the breakouts uh, the the virtual in polio now booth is the best I have ever seen. You can't get that much information by walking by a booth in person. And that what what John just showed you is a documentary that I believe is either a half hour or an hour long, and there's a link to get to it. And the whole in polio now uh, virtual booth is about a half hour's worth of videos, and there's numerous others. If you do want the best I've ever seen resources for anything to do about polio, uh, spend that half hour on the uh, virtual booth and or uh, you could see that whole documentary. That is new. Okay. Oh, good. Thanks, Tim. I just posted that link that you had sent to me in the, uh, in the chat for people to grab if they would like to. Thank you, John. It's a tremendous resource. So. I touched on it a little bit, and and uh, you know the you have heard the controversy over who, and you have also heard the controversy over injective you know uh, uh, inoculations for viruses and you know et cetera et cetera, and and a lot recently specific to polio, and uh, and there's been a lot of Rotarians and and medical and politicians. Uh, you know, with making statements. Uh, some of you may have heard recently, I think it's uh, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, you know, and, uh, launched a anti uh, Bill Gates. Uh, he's making money on it and et cetera, and it's a scam and it's blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's proven 350 cases a year, 72 this year, and a year with 22. It is a proven fix with nothing we have found that can do any better. It has saved, you know, thousands of lives and it's prevented, I think they figured 20 million children from being paralyzed. It is very successful, irregardless of the politics and irregardless of the current situation with who. Um, you know, and with, with us not having had polio in this country for so long, we like to put it on the back burner. And I can tell you, uh, you know, I'm a, Chris Tan knows I'm a water and sanitation guy. I've traveled the world. I've been to Africa 12 times. I've done $10 million worth of rotary grants. Um, I, I would much rather spend that money on water and sanitation, which would help polio than on polio. Rotary will not give up. It, it is a promise we made to the children of the world. It's proven successful. And uh, like everything in our world that's controversial, there's going to be a negative and the negative gets amplified by small minorities and squashes our efforts. Um, and we've been trying desperately to defray them. So I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to hopefully accomplish that uh, to you to pass on to other club members. So 
you know, when I wear my polio attire, which I do often, yeah. young people come up to me and say, what is polio? You know, and, you know, well, we've spent $18 billion trying to get rid of it. It's yeah. a virus, you know, that we haven't seen in our country. They look at me like I'm crazy, you know. What are you talking about, you know? And, and we haven't seen it for so long. So keep up your good work. Thank you. Uh, Chris Ann? Um, I privately sent a message to Greg White since he mentioned that he had polio as a child. And he is willing to tell us what that was like. So I'm wondering, Greg, if you could do that now. Thank you, Chris Ann. Thank you. Uh, um, first of all, I have to admit, I was too young to remember having polio. And I'm very happy to say both my brother and I um, have no known or known to us anyway um, side effects. On the other hand, my mother talked often about how when there was polio, that the house was quarantined and that they packed things in the front door. This house is quarantined. Um, it always struck her as odd that the mother and the children had to stay home but the fathers were free to come and go to work, et cetera. Um, so it was kind of a, you know, in those days, you know, there were, there were no ro female Rotarians and, and very few women worked in the office, to be honest. And, and it was kind of odd that, that men could go. Um, that really pissed my mother off to no end, um, long afterward. I remember as a child that the uh, greengrocer would go up and down the alley and he would sell green, you know, the vegetables to the home through the alley um, because mother couldn't go to work and the uh, green grocer came to, to, to the house. I, I don't know what happened with, with, you know, supermarkets probably weren't even invented yet. Um, by the way, this was 1953 and 54. I remember going to Highland Park High School, perhaps the only time I was in the high school, and they, um, the nurses or whoever there was there administering the oral vaccine put me in a special line because I'd already had polio. So all I got was a little bit of grape juice and they said this was, uh, um, you know, what we get. And we were made to feel, I suppose, special. Um, I would tell uh, the governor that, that, that um, due to other reasons, I go to uh, Kurt Kenny um, almost every week. Um, and then we have an appointment on Monday. Um, and I talked to the people at Courage Kenny, and of course, they don't see polio anymore. And they, and frankly, they hardly know who Sister Kenny was. And of course, Sister Kenny was an important part of my life. Um, for those who don't know, um, Sister Kenny did not promote bed rest. Instead, she promoted exercise. And even when you couldn't, one, even when one could not pick up one's leg oneself, the nurses or whomever the therapist would come by, and move legs and arms for you. Um, her, her thing was atrophy is a, equally as uh, lethal as the polio. And so therefore we, um, we were exercised in our bed and or some cold and, and, and my brother remembers this very vividly. Um, my brother had much more severe case than I had. And today, you know, he's 72 years old and playing racquetball. So, uh, or, or squash, he would never, never play racquetball. That would be them. But anyway, um, I have a question, if, if I may, and that is, do you think, or two, two questions. First of all, what is the controversy within Rotary about and polio now? And secondly, do you think that perhaps the COVID-19 um, vaccination, when it's finally developed, will be distributed at the same time on along the same lines as polio's vaccination? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Two great questions. I would ad advocate absolutely on the distribution. You know, as we well know, many of us were inoculated from polio when we were a child, and and uh, and, and most of us in the United States were given injections, not the oral. Um, Salk invented the uh, injectable type, and five years later, Sabin uh, did the oral. And the oral obviously doesn't take professionals to administer, and you can do door to door campaigns like Rotary does and has been involved in. So, I think I froze up again. Am I back? Yep, you're back. We heard through the door-to-door -door campaigns. Okay, and Greg, what was your first question again? 
my two questions were, um, what is the controversy within Rotary about and uh, polio now? The second question was, can it be, um, uh, can both COVID-19 and uh, polio vaccines be done at the same time? Of course, that, a lot of that depends upon if COVID-19 is an oral vaccine. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and that's, you know, that's, uh, we, got, we don't know that yet, so we won't know that. If it's not oral, no. If it is oral, yes. So, um, but the controversy within Rotary is really, uh, from my perspective, more prominent, more severe causes that we could be spending the money on. Uh, you know, it's rumored that if it weren't for polio, we'd be focusing on water and sanitation because water and sanitation is necessary in all six areas of focus, I'm sorry, now seven areas of focus that the Rotary Foundation has. I mean, you can't, why bother educating children if they're gonna get sick because they have poor water? Uh, you know, uh, every area of focus needs clean water and sanitation, health, disease prevention and control, you name it. So that's the controversy. Why is Rotary spending so much money on polio when, we haven't seen a case in the in our country for 50 years, and and uh, there's only been you know 20 to 200 cases in the world. You're you know why bother? That's a terrible approach to take because every life is valuable, no matter where they are or who they are. So, and it's a commitment that Rotary made to the children of the world. You know, back in 1978. You know, for its 75th anniversary cause. So, uh, we, you know, our goal is, is to make it the second uh, curable disease in the world. And I can't answer any better than that, Greg. But that's, that, that's what I hear constantly and continuously is, you know, there are so many other much more dire needed places for our funding and our money than polio. Hmm. Chris Ann. Tim, now that you say that, um, that is a lot of money for two countries. Why is it so expensive? It's given worldwide still, Chris Ann. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and, and in order to protect the course. children, until it's gone completely, it has to be administered. It costs more every year. It costs, you know, we're spending, I, I had numbers on it. It was like the, you know, the, 30 years it was 1.2 billion and the next it was 2 billion and you know now we're spending it was determined by the uh, global eradication for polio initiative gepi uh, two or three years ago that it would take another 6.5 billion and we have commitments for that 6.5 billion over that five-year period of time rotary is part of it so, and I, I believe that number ended up, that was a few years back. So I believe the number is, you know, it's gonna take 22 or $23 billion to get rid of polio uh, since we started in 1988 with, Rotary didn't start then since the GEPI started. Thank I think you. It's as, as long as it's, and uh, yeah, I'm unmuted. As long as it's in just, as we might say, just two countries. As long as it's in two countries, the whole world is at, at threat of it. it. Until it's completely gone, we're all uh, yep. at risk. Yep, absolutely, Vicki. Elke, uh, you had raised your hand before and I apologize for not uh, calling on you. Go ahead. It's okay, there's been a lot of good questions and discussion. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say that it's been really interesting to hear you speak because with COVID, I've had a lot of conversations with my older uncles and my grandfather about what Minneapolis looks like when it was shut down for polio um, and kind of how that compares now to COVID and the community reaction and pushing back against restrictions. So that's been really interesting to see those parallels. Um, my question was about addressing it in Af um, Afghanistan and Pakistan. What are some of the biggest challenges with um, reaching full vaccination in those countries. I would imagine a lot of it has to do with displaced communities, um, potentially civic unrest, but I'd be curious to hear 
um, from your perspective, where are some of the biggest challenges? You kind of really hit the nail on the head. It's political and it was used, you know, campaigns were used to advocate that the uh, polio, you know, polio was a poison and, uh, you know, they were coming to kill your children and the government was not supporting it until last year, until uh, the last elections in Pakistan. And, and that's why they're actually going up now. Uh, and it was predominantly the hard to reach areas of the world, you know, where we just couldn't get there. And it crosses the border, you know, in a pond or with a person. And there's no border, you know, there's no wall between Afghanistan and Pakistan and the countries that surround it. So it walks across borders in the most remote areas of them countries. So, um, you know, now they normally, you know, sick children and infected children don't normally leave their villages in these remote areas of the world. But if I would have to say, I look at it, it was political and it's not anymore. You all may remember K.R. Ravindran was our Rotary International President uh, in 1516. He's from uh, Sri Lanka. He was instrumental in going over to Pakistan and convincing their governments to get on board. He was unsuccessful because of the current government situation that they had. Mm -hmm. But since his efforts have paid off and their government is now very supportive and I, you know, it, it is known to be a fact that the surge, the slight increase that we've seen are them cases that we were not able to get to. So we get through COVID, um, and, you know, we're, we are really that close. And yeah. unfortunately, a lot of them dollars too, I should point out, thank you for bringing that up, that it's gonna take that $6 billion. It takes three years to to designate a country as polio free once the last case was and all of us in the world are going to have to give uh, inoculations for them three years even more yeah yeah so that's you know it, it actually increases every year it gets harder so yeah it really reminds me of that uh the economic principle that you know you accomplish 80 percent of any goal with 20 percent of the effort but that last 20 percent will take you 80 and i think even more when you're this close it's yep. tremendous resources to yep. to reach yep. michael you had a question yeah actually it was more of a comment and it was something that uh, tim was addressing on the money that Rotary's putting towards polio eradication. And one of the things that I learned when we were in India and one of the problems that, that it's taken us 30 years to get where we are is that a lot of the tribal leaders in countries would come when Rotary showed up and said, we want to inoculate your children and vaccinate them against polio. They said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We have other problems uh, that need to be addressed first, clean water, proper schools, proper sanitation. And that's when a lot of those global grants would be funded. And Rotary developed a relationship with these communities by putting in the clean, uh, the, the toilets, uh, the, the water, improving their schools. And then they said, okay, now you can vaccinate us. So even though the money might, might be going towards polio eradication, it is also being spent in other areas as well. So it's not just all going to polio. And, and as some people have, have pointed out here, we've learned a lot from, from the polio eradication initiative and as, as Tim mentioned, they're using that for COVID. They used it for uh, malaria. They used it for Ebola, other uh, other um, uh, problems, uh, health problems around the world. So th the money, yes, it might be going towards polio, but it's being used to improve a lot of other issues as well. I believe it to be no coincidence that Gabby joined 
our polio uh, initiative, GEPI, last year because they are instrumental worldwide in the development of a vaccine for COVID. And I'm very hopeful they get an oral or something that's easy to administer. I mean, it's daunting to think of if polio has wreaked havoc for this long and we're not there yet. And COVID is much more severe, you know, not only by case, but uh, ability to transmit that we don't, aren't totally sure yet how it's happening or and why it's happening. But, you know, we know it's human to human or water or saliva, it, you know. But the silver lining is uh, Gavi is uh, part of one of our partners now. And, you know, a lot of people are distraught that are, that are our best supporters for polio. We have huge contributors to polio. Um, you know, all, only... 9% of us in Rotary have given directly to Polio Plus, and only 43% of our clubs give to polio. Um, wow. You know, versus the annual fund and all of the other causes that our clubs contribute to. So, um, uh, you know, there's a the contingency of polio advocates are just elated of the of having Gavi as part of our forces and focusing our polio dollars, our, our $2 billion of rotary money we've given since we started this cause. Mm. And I, I believe it to be a huge attribute to promote the polio cause as well, because it helps make the connection for the people I was talking about that have no idea what polio even is and that we're still, why we're still fighting it. Mm. I think they'll understand it a little better with the uh, with the efforts that we are now pushing over onto COVID-19. And we haven't given up on polio. We have given up door-to-door -door immunizations in, you know, obviously for obvious reasons, which aren't in very many countries of the world anymore. So. Thanks, Tim. Hey, we are at an hour. Both uh, Kirk and I need to uh, be done right at 5.30 today. So, um, Chris Ann, I think we're going to try to make you host, which just means you can stay on and visit as long as you would like or not and shut the meeting down after that. But I would like to uh, bring up um, the Rotary four-way test as we normally do. We end our meetings with this if everyone can take themselves off of mute. All right, the rotary four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Say and do. Is, is it, it the truth? truth? Is, is, it, is it fair? Is it fair? Will, will it build goodwill and better, 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 better friendships? friendships? Will, will it be beneficial? Will it be beneficial? Concerns. So, Tim, just, uh, you know, we can't thank you enough for being here. And this was enlightening and, yes, <laughs> Enlightening, wonderful. The video was great. Your presentation, your facts were great. Just really interesting to to hear the update and to learn more and you know hear about the controversy and you know hopefully we can all work together to get this final little bit taken care of. So, thank you so much for having me, Chris.